we are we are on welcome everybody for the second session um we just had a great um first session for this event my name is octavia burto i am associate professor at the scripps institution of oceanography and it is a pleasure to be to be here with all the panelists and all the people that will tell us um, many, many important things about mangroves. I just want to um, give a very brief introduction. I think we are in a moment of um, um, a great moment, the next decade. It's a very, very important decade to achieve conservation goals for, for this planet, for many ecosystems. And one of them, or probably one of the most important of them, are mangrove uh, ecosystems. So increased spatial and temporal resolution of data capture would represent a greater opportunity to further enhance our understanding of the status and trends in marine habitats and ecosystems, the drivers of change and the impacts of degradation on their contribution to people. This will also improve visualization and maps to support the decision-making uh, process. Effective management requires governments to know where, what, why, and how much of an activity is sustainable as anthropogenic impacts expand further offshore. By accomplish this goal, increasing our technology for mapping, uh, there will be numerous additional benefits beyond increasing our understanding of the planet, uh, including improve management plans, technological advances, training of new generations of scientists from diverse backgrounds and increased collaborations between stakeholders. So for that reason, um, I think this webinar, it's very, very important. Um, and I hope you enjoy all these presentations. So uh, let's start with our First uh, panelist, um, we will um, start with Steve Shield from the Nature Conservancy, Drones in the Caribbean. And uh, Steve, the All microphone. right, can you hear me? Am I coming across? Okay, let's start this up. Okay, so I'm gonna, talk to you about some of the projects that we're doing in the in the Caribbean. My name is Steve Schill. I'm the lead scientist for the Caribbean. And uh, hopefully you can see this. So let's uh, start with a few, uh, few maps here. And this shows you some of the mapping projects that we've done uh, in the Caribbean over the past uh, 10 years. And most of these have been coral focused, but we've also been working on mangrove restoration. And you can see the numbers here. Uh, just over half a million mangroves have been planted in some of these sites. Uh, we work in uh, seven offices across the Caribbean. I'm gonna focus on the insular Caribbean. We're working in 17 countries and territories. And we focus on uh, ocean management, uh, coral protection, working on mangrove restoration and also climate change adaptation. And specifically, we'll, we work a lot with identifying sites uh, where we can use nature-based solutions to help protect coastal communities. So some of the things that we've been working on include uh, high resolution uh, mapping of mangroves and we're using drones uh, for a lot of that, as well as high resolution image data, data maps. Uh, such as you know Google Earth and uh, Bing imagery. And this is really important for picking up the smaller fringing mangroves, which are characteristic of these uh, small island uh, systems. Uh, we're, we're spending a lot of time with partners working on mangrove biophysical indicators uh, and developing health indices. Uh, we've carried out a number of drone uh, training exercises with government agencies and other partners. Uh, we've mapped quite a few uh, mangrove patches in many of the Eastern Caribbean states. 
uh, which are critical for inventory, uh, the inventory of these systems. And then uh, we've also been working on identifying optimal sites, like I mentioned, for nature-based solutions and for the blue carbon work that we're, we're starting to, to do. And finally, we've been doing a lot of work with uh, cloud computing using, using Google Earth Engine to estimate mangrove change over time, taking advantage of these uh, high resolution data sets that we've been developing. So here's an example of some of the mapping products. Uh, we've mapped over uh, just over 900,000 hectare. And when we overlay the, the managed area database that we have, there's about 59% that are included within, within these uh, managed area polygons. Now, not all of these are being actively managed. There's, there's many times in governments when uh, uh, hotel proposals come in and, and then mangroves are removed. So, so continually uh, educating uh, the stakeholders and working with them to understand the importance of these mangroves and the value that they contribute um, is something that uh, is, a, is a primary objective of our work. Here you can see some examples, some of the detail uh, from our mangrove database. And these data, data sets are available for download at our uh, Caribbean Atlas uh, page, which, which uh, I'll, be, I'll provide on the, on the chat. Um, here's an example showing uh, how some of those, those small, narrow, fringing mangrove patches are often excluded in some of these global data sets because they're they're very they're very narrow. Um, sometimes they can be less than five meters across, but but they're very important for connectivity in these local local systems. Uh, we've done a lot of work. I'm going to show you uh, some examples, some case studies. Here's an example in Baja Yuna in Dominican Republic in the Samana Bay, one of the largest uh, mangrove forests there where we've done a number of projects uh, working with partners to inventory uh, biophysical characteristics such as the diameter breast height and modeling that with mangrove biomass uh, from remotely sensed uh, products. Uh, in this area, we've seen a loss of about 233 hectare of mangrove since 2003. But at the same time, we've seen growth of mangroves over 200 hectare uh, around the mouth of the river. So here's an example showing uh, some uh, the area where mangrove loss has occurred in the north uh, with a lot of aquaculture activities, as you can see here. But as we look in the south, we can see over the past 14 years uh, the gradual extent of, of the mangroves uh, because of the sedimentation that the river uh, delivers and the mangroves continue to creep out into the bay. Uh, we've done quite a bit with drone mapping uh, since 2014 throughout the Caribbean. As I mentioned, uh, this is the system we started with. It's a modified Sony QX1 that we converted to uh, near infrared, uh, which enabled us to do a lot more uh, vegetation mapping and understanding the dynamics of these systems. Uh, this is a very large sensor and it gives us really good imagery. Um, and uh, here's some examples showing, uh, this is in Salt River, Jamaica, uh, near the Portland Bight, uh, where a causeway has caused a large area of mangroves to die off. And, and we use drones to monitor these systems and look at changes and how we can, we can uh, reintroduce the flow needed to restore these, these systems. This is an example in, in Tyrell Bay, Grenada, where they've undergone a uh, marine expansion project, and we're monitoring the effects that this is having on, on mangrove systems. And, and drones are really a great way to, to be able to do that on a regular basis and, and get the resolution that you need to, to look at the impacts that this is having on, on mangrove systems. And another example uh, that I want to end with is Ashton Lagoon that we've been monitoring. This is in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And this was a marina construction uh, in the 90s that was uh, abandoned. And a lot of the flow to this mangrove, which is the largest mangrove patch for St. Vincent and the Grenadines, was cut off. And we, we saw a lot of die off in the central part of the mangroves. And so we've been mapping this over time. 
here you can see some of the products uh, showing those, those finger piers that were built, uh, the natural color and the infrared uh, products, and then the digital surface models, which allow us insight into the, the biomass and the, the structure of, of the mangroves. And this is all at a two to four centimeter uh, resolution. So we've been able to map uh, the reduction of these mangroves, the increase, you can see the, in the increase along the, the finger piers there. And uh, a lot of work has been done to try to try to restore. Uh, we've worked with local partners to uh, plant, uh, replant mangroves in that central area. And also they've been doing work on reestablishing re the natural flow to the lagoon and putting in uh, cuts to the, these original finger piers that were built. And you can see the difference that that makes uh, in, in the water quality. And finally, the work we've been doing with Google Earth Engine, uh, looking at NDVI change, we've been using the polygons from our high resolution mangrove data sets to look at change over time using Landsat 8 since 2013. And here's some examples showing uh, a, crew, a cruise ship that was built in, uh, in Maimon, uh, Dominican Republic. And you can see in the red, the, the loss of vegetation there and that can be summarized in our in our uh, shape files um, we can look at uh, NDVI change and look at the developed thresholds to indicate loss and and all, all these are available on our on our, our site uh, the Caribbean Atlas uh, site for the TNC team and then here's an example in Makote in St. Lucia where we've uh, done a lot of mangrove restoration work uh, working with partners. Uh, there's been some die-off in this area and, and we've uh, carried out a number of restoration projects with partners there. And you can see the, the change in the biomass and the growth of, of mangroves over, over this uh, five-year period. So that's a quick roundup of the work that we've done. And uh, I want to turn it back to you, Octavio. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, Actually, I forget to mention that we will have some polls during the presentation. So please um, um, stay with us and participate in these polls. And uh, after all the presentations, we will have um, a panel, a discussion panel with all our speakers. So uh, next in the list is um, Astrid Chu from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography drones and machine learning for local monitoring. Astrid. Great, hello everyone. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, and you guys can all see that, yes? Um, yes. Great, so Hi everyone, my name is Astrid Su. I'm a researcher at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Today I'll be talking about drones and machine learning, um, especially for local monitoring. And this is work done in collaboration with Engineers for Exploration and Central para la Biodiversidad Marina y la Conservación. All right, when it comes to mangroves, Mexico has quite the coverage and diversity of them. From the two meter shrubby desert mangroves of Baja to the 40 meter giants in the forest of La Encrucijada, Mexico is fifth in the world for the country with the most mangroves. In fact, Mexico has an agency, CONABIO, or the Commission of Biodiversity, that conducts a mangrove inventory once every five years. In 2015, CONABIO reported a total coverage of 775,000 hectares of mangroves for all of Mexico. In 2019, we also held a workshop on drones for environmental monitoring with four Mexican agencies, CONAMP, the National Commission of Natural Protected Areas, CONAGUA, the National Commission of Water, INEHI, the National Institute of Statistics and Geography, and CERETU, the Secretariat of um, Agrarian Land and Urban Development. And we asked them, what are your main goals when it comes to monitoring and managing wetlands? Currently, their priority is to update wetland maps, specifically increase the resolution of their maps from 1 in 150,000 units to 1 in 50,000 units, essentially increase it by three times. 
Furthermore, they're looking to de define fine details of their habitats to help inform management decision making. But these four agencies, currently they've been relying on the maps that Conabio publishes, the ones that I mentioned early in this talk. And what these maps rely on are satellite imagery. This is what their satellite imagery looks like. Um, satellites are great. <laughs> They're able to cover uh, the entire globe, let alone all of Mexico. So very fantastic in being able to image a large area. However, satellites tend to be relatively coarse. This is an example of Sentinel with a resolution of 10 meters per pixel. And so you can see, it's a little bit hard to distinguish what it is, at least optically, especially if you need more detail for a local region. For the last couple of years, we've been going around Mexico and imaging mangrove forests. And we're able to get much sharper imagery thanks to drones, similar to what Steve mentioned. Our resolution is about three centimeters per pixel. And whether or not you have satellite imagery or drone imagery, in order to make this imagery meaningful, they need to be labeled. And with higher resolution imagery, you also need more detailed labels. So here's an example of a drone imagery that we have and what it looks like labeled. Um, traditionally, this is done manually, so by hand, sitting there drawing polygons. And this can take anywhere from 300 to 400 hours to label one kilometer squared. It's incredibly labor and time intensive. So we're looking to see, okay, well, how can we expedite this? And we've turned to machine learning, specifically deep learning. We've been using convolutional neural networks, or CNNs, which are really powerful because they're able to take limited training data and produce highly accurate label. Essentially, it takes our hand labels, tileizes them, essentially make them into a tile, and then classifies the resulting tile. Um, it, it does this by extracting image features to produce these labels. And here's a progression of our algorithms from left to right. Left is uh, the oldest one, right is the newest one. And as you go through this progression, each edition, you can see that we've been able to increase not only our accuracy, but our precision of these models. And this is possible because we leaned on transfer learning to get more accurate models with less data. However, CNNs have one weakness, and it's in the fact that they use tiles, right? These tiles essentially perform worse on less contiguous areas of a mangrove forest. So what does that mean? When you are looking at this drone imagery in which we're labeling, this fine detail of hand labels are essentially lost in CNNs. Instead, it becomes covered with rectangles. And so we want to maintain that fine detail. And so we're now employing UNET uh, for classification, which is great because it builds upon the feature extractions of CNNs. But instead of outputting a tile classification, its output is pixel classifications. So we're able to maintain that fine detailed classification. So here's an example of these two algorithms um, compared. The CNN is the light green, so you can see it's quite boxy, it's overestimating in some areas, ignoring others. On the other hand, the unit is the dirt green mangrove. Um, and you can see it's really capturing the small tufts and islands of mangroves. This is especially important because if you're looking at monitoring a restoration area, where maybe you've planted saplings and are monitoring its growth or the failures. Um, or maybe you're also looking at a mangrove stand that is highly sensitive and it's facing a lot of mangrove loss. In both of these scenarios, your mangrove stand is actually highly fragmented. So it's especially important that we're preserving this high detail and having a robust monitoring system so that we can stage interventions as needed. So from our tools that we've built um, from the machine learning, we're now expanding access and we're currently developing an assistive labeling application. This is, uh, will be available for users to download. Um, they can upload their own orthomosaic uh, image that they would like to label and it, this can be done offline. As they're labeling their image through this application, smart suggestions, which are powered by AI, will automatically uh, pop up. And essentially, this is a mechanism to enable faster labeling of high resolution imagery. Likewise, we're also currently developing an image classification portal. 
And because deep learning models aren't necessarily the easiest thing for ecologists or other stakeholders to use, um, and especially because this entire classification scheme requires strong computing power, this portal enables users to upload their image. Um, it'll be computed, processed on our end using Microsoft Azure, and then labels, um, these classifications, will be, then be made available for end users to download, and then they can proceed on with their own analyses. Both of these two access options will be available in early fall. So combine our machine learning and as well as our different access options, together they'll really uh, provide an opportunity for others to expedite labeling by harnessing the power of machine learning. Additionally, with drones, we can produce higher resolution maps. And furthermore, we won't have to wait five years for the next update of the map. Rather, we can produce these maps annually, monthly, and as needed. Ultimately, we are looking to equip resource managers and decision makers with the data that they need to take sustainable decisions. We're looking to support them in gathering data through drones, as well as labeling their imagery that they uh, come up with. Essentially, the tools that we are building are designed to be flexible to fit the different needs, capabilities, and capacities of different stakeholders. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. I'd like to acknowledge our funders. You can contact me at my email or on Twitter. And then if we have time, I yield the rest of the time to questions. Well, I think um, the audience is uh, putting their questions in the, in the box of the Q&A. And maybe we can bring all these questions. We will answer some of them during the these presentations, but uh, probably in the in the panel discussion discussion panel, we will address all of all of them. So uh, let's um, continue with the next presentation. So Nathan Thomas and Pete Bontin from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, we will hear about um, Global Mangrove Watch. Hi, uh, thanks, Natalia. Uh, share my screen. Uh, give me a moment. Uh, um, uh, okay, I guess is that the right one, or is it a different screen? Do I need to? It's a different screen. Uh, switch to this one. Perfect. There we go. Okay, great. <clears throat> um, so thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm Nathan. I'm a postdoc, um, University of Maryland postdoc at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, I would just like to give you of some of the science behind the Gold Mangrove Watch. I know that uh, Pete Pending has given um, an overview of some of the products already, uh, but I thought I would take a, a little step back for those who are less familiar with um, some of the remote sensing processes, uh, give more of an introductory um, level talk on some of the data sets that we use and the way that we process data to make the uh, global scale maps. Um, so first of all, as you know, we have this uh, global scale uh, map of mangrove extent, um, which is based um, on the year uh, 2010. Um, so how do we go about making this map? So uh, first of all, we decide to um, define uh, what we think is a reasonable mangrove habitat. So we know that mangroves don't exist in very high latitudes um, or at very high elevations. Um, so we have this two-step approach, firstly, um, that defines this initial mangrove habitat. And this is basically, as I said, is targeting areas where we expect mangroves to be. Um, and this is based on some of the existing mangrove maps that exist. So we pull statistics from their locations, and that helps us, uh, helps inform us of where these uh, locations are. Um, we do this based on elevation and distance to coastal water. So in elevation, we use the SRTM uh, global elevation data set. Um, and we basically just use this to exclude um, any areas that are above low-lying um, regions where we know mangroves grow, so in tidal areas, for instance. Um, and then again, uh, we create this coastal water mask um, and then use thresholds um, on the distance of mangroves to that coastal water. Um, mangroves do obviously grow in, in freshwater environments, but um, the vast majority are at the coast. Um, so if uh, we're not expecting to find mangroves, sort of many hundreds of kilometers um, inland somewhere. So to uh, 
remove some of the uh, confusion around this, uh, we also use this uh, distance to coastal water mass. Um, in terms of the data sets we use, uh, we have uh, two main types. We have radar data and optical data. For the radar data, we use uh, Japanese Space Agency ALOS Palsar data. Um, and in total, I think there's around 1,500 ALOS Palsar images we use to create the GMW baseline map. And there's around 21 million pixels per band. Um, we use two bands for this sensor, so that's 42 million pixels um, in total. Uh, for the optical data, we use a blend of both Landsat 5 and Landsat 7. Uh, as you know, the uh, tropics um, has a problem with cloud cover, so we can't always guarantee to get um, good imagery. So we have to blend um, a couple of satellites to get the best coverage. Um, in total, there was 15,000 uh, Landsat images were used across 1,800 scenes. So it took 15,000 images in total to make 1,800 um, composites. And there are 55 million pixels per band. So this just gives you an idea of the um, data volumes uh, that go into a project of this size. So I want to talk about the radar uh, imagery a little bit more. Um, so radar is sensitive to a number of uh, physical properties of land cover types and vegetation. Um, so predominantly water content, size, uh, surface roughness, and that is in uh, relation to the wavelength. So how big your target is and compared to how big your wavelength is, and also the orientation of that target. Um, if you look at that diagram, you can see the numerous ways in which uh, radar is scattered from uh, various targets. So uh, at the canopy, we have something called volumetric scattering. Um, so uh, this causes the radar to come in in one direction and scatter in many different directions. Uh, we have specular scattering, which usually occurs off a water surface. Um, as radars tend to be uh, side looking, if you have a, a flat uh, surface, like a water surface, uh, incoming radar energy will, will bounce off it and away from the sensor, so you get little return there. Um, and then within um, flooded forests, which are quite unique to mangrove environments, we have what's known as this double bounce scattering mechanism. And this occurs when the radar uh, interacts with um, maybe the trunk of a mangrove forest and then bounces off into the water or vice versa. Um, and this causes sort of a prism effect where the, uh, the radar uh, signal comes back to the um, directly back to the sensor. So it looks like it's been enhanced basically because so much energy um, is coming back towards the sensor. Um, we have two what's known as polarizations and this is the orientation of the electric wave um, of, the, of the signal. We have copol, which basically means that um, the polarization uh, is the same going out as it is coming back in. In this case, it's horizontally uh, transmitted and horizontally received. And this is quite sensitive to these vertical trunks uh, physical targets such as trunks and this double bound scattering mechanism you see. And we also have a cross pole, and this is when the energy is submitted horizontally, but then it's received vertically. Um, what causes this to change is every time the radar interacts with a surface, it can change orientation. And um, when you have volumetric scattering, like a canopy, which is a very complex target with lots of branches, lots of different directions, this basically causes the uh, electric plane of the, of the wave to uh, orientate from horizontal to vertical. So using these two different bands, we can uh, differentiate different properties of a target. Um, just to give you an idea, this is what radar image looks like. Um, these are the mangroves at Parak, uh, Malaysia. And you can see um, the sort of relatively subtle difference. Um, but you can see that the darker mangroves compared to the lighter um, non-vegetated uh, and, and urban environments around it. Moving on to the optical imagery. Uh, our Landsat data is sensitive to uh, biophysical properties of vegetation, uh, particularly photosynthetic veg and then water content. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with this, um, if you look at the diagram there, you can see how different wavelengths reflect um, from a uh, plant differently. So uh, the red and the green, uh, sorry, the red and the blue are uh, susceptible to chlorophyll absorption. Um, but then in the near infrared, you have a strong reflectance. Uh, due to the spongy mesophyll in the uh, plant leaf structure. And then further on the wavelength, um, down near the short wave infrared spectrum or portion of the spectrum, we have water absorption features. Um, and this can tell us how much water content is in a uh, line cover type or a target. And the real benefit of this is that um, each, of, each type of vegetation reflects these wavelengths slightly differently. Um, so this is just an example from the visible to the near infrared um, just how different species are uh, absorb and reflect light differently because of 
the uh, chemical and physical properties. So we have a differentiation or variation um, between species in the light that they use and both reflect. Um, and to give you an idea of just what this what mangroves look like, this again is the mangroves of Parak in Malaysia. Um, and you can see that mangroves really jump out there. Um, this is a false color image, um, but it shows uh, how the red shape is both photosynthetic and then very wet. So the deeper orange color is um, because there's a lot more water in this environment than there is in the sort of more yellowy, drier uh, land covers around it. So we have all these images. So we break up the world into 128 different projects. Um, and then for each one of these, we follow uh, the following workflow. So as I mentioned, we have this coastal mask and this uh, mangrove habitat layer that we begin with. Uh, then we uh, generate training data. And training data basically uh, is a way for us to tell a algorithm or a machine what mangroves look like. And for this, we use 12.8 million training samples globally. We then use two, uh, a two-step approach to classification. So we have a mangrove baseline A, which uses machine learning algorithms um, using the radar data. And then we have mangrove baseline B, which within that area, um, within mangrove baseline A, we reclassify using the Landsat data. And this um, tries to get the machine, and now it knows what mangroves look like, to try and recognize an unknown pixel that we feed it. Um, and then a machine is then able to decide um, and say this un un unknown pixel is a mangrove um, or whatnot. Um, and then we can use uh, local scale da data and earth and, uh, imagery to go and Google Earth and imagery to go and validate this. Um, and then we end up with our global mangrove baseline. Um, I do want to touch briefly upon some of the changes also that we create. Um, I know that Pete spoke about this um, in some detail, but we know that mangroves are driven, uh, mangrove change is driven by natural and human causes. Um, so does that mean we have to make a new global map every year? Um, well, obviously, uh, given the volume of data, that's a very labor intensive uh, and very machine intensive process. So instead, we detect changes that are existing in our current baseline. Um, and you can see from that plot there that the uh, uh, backscatter from mangroves and water is, is very different, very distinct. So by taking a mask of our existing mangrove baseline, um, looking at the statistics of that, we can then look into certain regions of the statistical distribution, such as the tails, um, and then we can begin to um, slice away at that tail and do some normality testing um, to let the machine automatically detect where the best threshold is. Uh, when we find that iteration and uh, apply that threshold, those are then the change features um, that we can apply to our baseline. And then we can do that every year. So rather than having to create a new baseline every year, we can just update with changes instead. Um, and that's what the image, uh, that's what the algorithm does. And you can see the red and the blue areas are the gain and loss areas respectively. Um, and I'll leave you there. Uh, thank you very much for um, all those listed there. And I will take um, any questions. Uh, thank you, Octavio. Thank you, Nathan. Um... Well, I think we are getting um, several questions. I will uh, probably ask them to you during the discussion panel. Um, let's um, let's move forward with Lola Fatoimbo from NASA as well, and remote sensing of mangrove biomass and loss drivers. Lola. Yes. Um... One second. I'm not going to share my screen. Oh, I, I'm going to log right back in to share my screen. Sorry. Okay. Maybe Astrid, is this a good time to have a, one of the polls? Yes, let's go ahead and do that. So let me launch one, here we go.
Here I am. Can you see my screen? Yes, Lola, yeah. we're just having a poll. Then okay. maybe a couple more seconds. Sounds good. Great. All right. Great. All right, Lola, take it away. Sounds good. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Lola Fatuyimbo, and I'm a research scientist at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. So today I'll be talking about some of our efforts on remote sensing on mangrove biomass and lost drivers. So um, as I mentioned today, I'll be talking about some of uh, the data products that we've been working on, in particular, two global data products that are relatively new in their availability. The first one is the global three-dimensional map of mangrove structure. And what I mean by mangrove structure is uh, mangrove canopy height and biomass um, and carbon stocks that we can then derive from those. And then also a new map of the, all the drivers of mangrove loss globally, and this is at 30 meter resolution. And we've developed these maps for a whole number of applications, ranging from applications for biomass and carbon cycle studies, um, studies of ecosystem condition and function in mangroves, uh, to get a better understanding of all the ecosystem services of mangroves, and finally, how we could better manage and restore them. So there is now a whole range of three-dimensional products that are available that we can and have been using to monitor mangrove structure. Um, I'm showing here a few of the new um, and Did we lose Lola? I think we have a problem with uh, Lola. Um, let's see if we can connect with, with her, Astrid. Yeah, we lost her. But uh, we hope that uh, she will connect soon. Maybe it's time for the next poll. <laughs> that is the reason why you need to have polls. So, uh, Claudio, uh, Lola is having some technical problems um, with yes. her machine. She'll be um, back with us um, as soon as possible. She'll have to restart her laptop. Fantastic. Octavio, maybe we can uh, we can have a question too. If there's a nice question in the uh, um, that there, I think that Astrid and uh, um, also Nathan could could answer. Um, basically, it's it's talking about. Um, what can you infer from the data? So what can you infer from drone data? What ecological characteristics can you infer from satellite data? Um, and specifically, the, the question was ask, asking about the drone. So can you do mangrove height biomass species from, from the drone data, data Astrid? And then maybe uh, maybe Nathan, you can follow up with sort of what, what do you think you can infer from uh, currently from satellite data? Absolutely, yeah. So for the drone data, we certainly can uh, produce these 3D models in which we're able to look at biomass, canopy height, things of that nature. Um, we are working on specific projects to uh, produce those calculations. Um, on the biodiversity end, looking at our imagery, because we're able to get such high resolution imagery, we are able in 
certain areas, at least, uh, to look at mangrove species and uh, be able to actually kind of look at the difference between the two based on their structural uh, characteristics. So specifically, depending on the altitude that you're flying at, um, color, leaf shape, things of that nature. Yes, I think um, what Ashley mentioned there um, is great. I think uh, it's very well suited to the, the very high resolution data set. Uh, with the sort of satellites uh, that we use, obviously our resolution is much lower um, and picking apart some of these detailed analysis can be much more difficult. Um, that's not to say that it can't be done. Um, the way in which we use the satellite data for the GNW map is very focused towards uh, land cover mapping. So we're really looking at uh, mangrove extent rather than necessarily looking at uh, kind of biophysical or ecological um, attributes. Um, to do so would probably require um, additional remote sensing data, satellite data. Um, you can use the radar slightly differently. Maybe use the uh, optical data. Um, maybe use other optical data that has a higher spectral um, resolution to pick out uh, other biophysical properties. Um, but the data we have can be used um, in some sense for uh, proxies for certain um, ecological um, factors. So maybe looking um, particularly at um, like the leaf area index um, and particularly changes through time. Um, I'm looking at uh, changes in water content. Um, they can begin to pick out proxies, but really our, our satellite based based data is really focused towards uh, land cover and extent mapping at this point. Thank Lola, you. you are back. Yes, I'm back. Apologies, my computer had a technical issue, but I'm back and I can jump right in. Yes, and just to mention that my colleague from UCSD, Ryan Kastner, <laughs> will continue helping us here. Um, he will lead the discussion session, but uh, yes, Lola, please. <laughs> Okay, so as I mentioned in the slide previously, we have a whole suite of new data sets available um, that are used to estimate um, uh, above ground that we can use to estimate 3D structure in, in forest and particularly in mangroves. Here I'm going to focus on two data sets um, that we've been using. One is from the shuttle radar topography mission, the SRTM DEM. Um, it's often used um, all over the world to estimate topography, but actually it turns out that it works really well to measure canopy height in mangrove forests. Now, as Nathan mentioned in his talk before, when we're working with radar data, um, we have to make some adjustments to the data sets. In this case, when we're working with a canopy height data in particular, we have to calibrate the data so that it actually measures what we're trying to see so that we can actually compare it with, what, with the types of measurements that we get either from um, an airborne instrument or maybe a drone, drone um, canopy height model, or in this case with in situ measurements. Um, so we've been working with an instrument called ISAT. This is the, the world's first spaceborne LIDAR instrument. And the advantage of LIDAR is that it's very accurate. So you get very accurate measurements of canopy height, but you only have samples. So you don't have wall-to-wall -wall imaging. Whereas with a LIDAR, with the radar data set, such as the SRTM or Shuttle Radar Topography Mission data set, we get wall-to-wall um, -wall coverage, but the accuracy is not as as good as we would um, as we would expect from a, from LIDAR or field measurements. So what we do by combining the two data sets, which is this this um, plot that you're seeing on the left, where we're comparing ISET two relative height and SRTM height, is to uh, derive a calibration model so that we can get at the height measurement that compares the best with what we see in the field or on the ground. We also have to do the same with our biomass map. So if once we have a canopy height map, we can then use that to actually derive biomass because there's an allometric relationship um, between the height of the tree and its biomass. Um, to do that, we have to do extensive field campaigns, which is what I'm showing here on the right, some cheerful people from a field campaign that we had in Central Africa. And what we then work on is deriving a biomass um, calibration model to get from height to biomass. Um, and we do this on a global scale. So here is a, the map of global canopy height that I'm showing. Because mangroves are only such a small band or, uh, on the coast, uh, it looks a little bit coarser here than it actually is. These maps are actually at 30 meter resolutions globally. 
And what you're seeing here, the numbers is all of the sites where we've collected field measurements. Um, so what are our main results? Um, we found that there is a huge range in canopy height in mangroves. They range up to 63 meters is the tallest mangrove that we found. Um, these are stands that are both in Gabon and in Colombia. And so we were also really interested in better understanding, you know, what are the main drivers between uh, the main drivers that lead to these really tall trees or to this large range in canopy height that we see across the world. Because in reality, most trees are actually not, most mangrove trees are not 65 meters tall. Globally, the average is about 13 meters. And so when we, when we compared our mangrove height and tried to relate it to some global environmental drivers that we had, we found that um, uh, precipitation, so the amount of fresh water that mangroves get, the mean temperature, and then also the frequency of cyclones were the best predictors of mangrove height. And it also, because height is directly related to biomass, also of mangrove biomass. So in this plot at the bottom left, what you're seeing is the relationship between latitude, above ground biomass, and tropical cyclone frequency. And what you'll see is that in those, um, in those central regions, those, those low latitudes where you have high, high um, temperatures, high rainfall, and low cyclone frequency, this is where you have the highest biomass globally. We also have, um, we've also generated uh, estimates of total, of, per country estimates for all of these va values, whether it's height or biomass or carbon stores. Um, and you could find these in this paper that was published by Samard and all last year. But really the take home message here is that Indonesia really dominates the global biomass and carbon stocks, um, followed by the uh, following five countries that have the largest area in biomass, in, in, in mangrove cover. Okay, so um, if interested, you can go and download this data set. It's available for free. If you're not uh, an expert in remote sensing or really what you're mostly interested in is visualizing the data and having the per country statistics, We've also developed an app which, for which you have the, the link here that you can go to and you can visualize the data. You can either visualize the canopy height map, the carbon stocks or the above ground biomass as published in the paper. Um, now in a second, I would like to talk to you about a new data set that has just been published last week, which is the global mangrove loss drivers. So here I'm showing you an example of mangrove loss that happened in 2017. On the left, you're seeing an image of the Florida Everglade mangroves um, before Hurricane Irma hit, and hit this area. And on the right, you're seeing what it looks like after the destruction of a very powerful storm. So to generate a global map of the lost drivers, we had to take a, a series of steps the first one being that we needed to know exactly where the loss was happening. So we needed a baseline loss extent map. We did this by, um, by looking at the entire archive of Landsat 5, 7, and 8 imagery, and we generated an NDVI anomaly. So we looked at the areas where you have the normalized differentiated vegetation index where those areas where the NDVI changed over time when you compare it to a baseline reference period from 1998 to 2001. And when comparing this, these areas, we were able to detect those regions where there were mangroves before and that had been lost between 2000 and 2016. We then used a um, random forest algorithm. This is a type of machine learning algorithm to essentially do a land cover change classification that separated the areas where there had been lost into three main categories. Those categories were bare soil, water, and wet soil. And by separating these, um, the, the losses into these three categories, that, that then gave us a better idea of what type of loss was actually happening in those regions. Was it being converted to something else or was it staying um, an open mangrove area or um, was it um, uh, not converted to, to would, would it regrow or not convert to something, to another land cover type? Um, so here's an example, two examples we have, one from Myanmar and one from Indonesia. And so here you see that this is, you know, really a 30 meter resolution, uh, detailed map of, of land cover changes. And this map 
Once we had then the map of, of land cover changes into those three categories, we then went through these land use change decision trees. I won't go through all the details of this tree because there's too many categories, but essentially we used a whole lot of um, decision mechanisms and ancillary data to decide whether um, the change that happened was separated into commodities. And when we say commodities, we mean um, either aquaculture or some type of agriculture, whether it was primarily due to erosion, whether it was non-productive conversion. So for example, cutting of mangroves, or if it was um, um, uh, extreme event driven. So here's an example from the Sundarbans in Bangladesh. Here we have primarily erosionally driven losses. And, what, and as you see here, we have these erosional bands. So we have separated it into three time periods, from uh, five year time periods. And you can really see how with the progression of time, because of erosion, most likely due to sea level rise, mangroves here were lost. Here's another example showing um, more of the coastal squeeze phenomenon where you have a combination of two types of loss drivers. From the seaward side, you have erosion. Um, and on the landward side, you have commodities. So this is a region where we have, where there is a lot of um, rice agriculture, for example. Um, here we have the global national loss driver trends. Essentially, each color here you're seeing is the primary driver for each country. You see that there is a big range in types of drivers. Um, but if we look at the bottom here, we have the per uh, continental breakdown of these main drivers. We find that in North America, the main, the main causes are due to extreme weather events and erosion. Um, in North and South America, both together. Um, in Africa, the primary driver is non-productive conversion. And, and in Asia here in G, the primary driver is due to commodities. Um, where in Oceania, again, it is a combination of erosion and extreme weather events. Now we also started to look at this um, on a per time scale because one of the goals was to see if these drivers have changed over time. Has there been any, any change in the rate of loss and in the, in the type of loss that we're seeing on a global scale? And what we did find is that direct human driven mangrove losses did decline. They declined by 73% from 2000 to 2016. Um, we also found that 62% of global losses from 2000 to 2016 resulted um, from human driven land use change. Um, but almost all of those changes that were human driven happened within six Southeast Asian countries. Um, but there's also a positive note to this story, which is that we found, you know, because, because there's a change in human driven losses, there is most likely um, effective conservation um, uh, outcomes that are happening um, and mangrove losses really are declining uh, rapidly. On the other hand, when you take out um, those six main countries where you have the commodities or human driven losses, what we're finding is that the contribution of uh, natural losses, such as extreme events like hurricanes, uh, cyclones, um, and erosion are actually increasing over time. Um, we have a, an app where you can download all of this data, um, the mangrove loss drivers app, you can read the paper, you can download the data and you can also visualize the data um, if you don't want to download it and process it on your own computer. Um, and with that, I'm, I would like to thank you. Thank you very much, Lola. And um, and we will move forward for the next presentation. And after that, probably we will have the last poll. Um, the next uh, presentation is Caleb Robinson uh, uh, from Microsoft Multi-Resolution Algorithms. Caleb. Hi, can you hear me and see my presentation? Um, we see your screen, not uh, the presentation. Uh, uh, let's try this. How about now? Now, now we see the presentation. Perfect. Awesome. Oh, great. Um, so thanks, everyone. Uh, my name is Caleb Robinson. I'm a data scientist at uh, 
Microsoft's AI for a Good Research Lab. Uh, and I'm going to talk today about multi-resolution algorithms for land cover mapping. This is work uh, done during my PhD uh, and that I'm continuing at AI for Good. Uh, so first, I just want to say thank you to all of the wonderful collaborators that have helped work on this with me. Um, so just thank you, everyone here. And start with what is the land cover mapping problem? So in land cover mapping, we're given high resolution satellite or aerial imagery. Um, in the imagery that I'm showing here, each uh, pixel in the image represents about a meter squared in real life. And our objective is to label each of these pixels as belonging to one of several different types of land cover classes. For example, here we have water, forest, field, and built up surfaces. And this land cover data is important for many different reasons. Uh, one of which is to inform conservation actions. Uh, so the example that I really like to give is this one of riparian buffer restorations. Uh, on the image over here on the left, you can see riparian buffers are these uh, vegetated areas that border streams and rivers and prevent harmful runoff from entering in the waterway. And land cover data can actually be used to find uh, areas in which these riparian buffers need to be fixed. So in this talk, I'm going to give uh, just one example of how we can train machine learning models to predict land cover uh, given uh, different types of uh, labels, specifically a mixture of high resolution and low resolution labels. Um, so we treat this problem as a semantic segmentation problem where our objective is to train a convolutional neural network to make high resolution predictions, we can see over here on the right, um, from given high resolution imagery. So we want to label, again, each pixel and the input as belonging to one of several different types of land cover classes, then use this trained model to uh, run inference over the entire area that we care about and get our land cover data. And the traditional way to train these models involves having a large labeled data set of pairs of high resolution imagery and high resolution ground truth labels. Um, and this works great if you do have access to these, you can uh, have your model make predictions or the training data set and then compare the model predictions uh, pixel by pixel with your ground truth data and use something like a cross entropy loss to update the parameters of the model. Um, but the problem is if we had access to this large labeled data set, our problem would be solved because that's the land cover data that we want, right? Uh, so in this setting, we're saying that we have access to high resolution labels, uh, but just from part of the area that we want to uh, make a land cover map of uh, and low resolution labels everywhere else. So specifically uh, in our setting, we have high resolution labels in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, which is this area in the northeastern US highlighted by uh, this blue outline uh, and access to low resolution labels at a 30 meter spatial resolution everywhere else in the continental United States. And the problem is, can we integrate these to train a model that will work well over the entire United States? So just to go over the data again, uh, we have high resolution imagery. This is at a one meter spatial resolution and it's available nationally, specifically it's from the NAEP program. We have high resolution labels. Uh, these are, again are at a one meter resolution and just available in this Chesapeake Bay watershed in the Northeast US. Uh, and then low resolution labels at a 30 meter spatial resolution uh, available all across the US. And the work or in the solution that we proposed here is this super resolution loss. Uh, and the super resolution loss allows us to uh, use the same model training setup where we have high resolution imagery uh, and then labels and training a segmentation model. But now instead of having uh, every single or having a value for every single pixel, we have uh, values in these 30 meter by 30 meter blocks. And the problem is, can we use these to inform the parameter updates of the model? I'm just gonna very briefly go over how this uh, super resolution loss idea works. So we take advantage of the fact that we have uh, an area in which we have overlapping low resolution and high resolution labels. And this is exactly this Chesapeake Bay watershed area that I was talking about. And we can use this overlap to compute the joint distribution between uh, these two uh, different data sets. And I'm giving an example of what this looks like down here at the bottom, uh, where you have a table that gives for every low resolution class that we have the distribution over high resolution classes. And what this says is on average, a pixel that is labeled as developed open space uh, will contain 0% of water, 42% of forest, 46% of field, and so on. We can use this information to actually train our model. 
And how we do this is look at each 30 meter block in the model's predictions and the ground truth labels that we have, we're calling the low resolution of the ground truth, uh, and comparing these distributions. So for example, this pixel here, the developed open space pixel, we know from the table it should contain 0% water, 42% forest, and so on. And then we can count the uh, predictions made by our model over the same block. And we can find, for example, that we have predicted here 50% water and 20% forest and so on. And what this gives us is two distributions of the same type of thing, counts of high resolution predictions, uh, an expected distribution from the low resolution data source and the predicted distribution from the model. And now that these are in the same format, we can compare the expected and predicted distributions with some differentiable distribution based measure, for example, KL divergence. Um, so our final training setup looks like this, where now we can use high resolution input imagery and high resolution ground truth labels uh, in order to train the model in areas in which we have access to those high resolution ground truth labels. And then high resolution imagery and low resolution ground truth labels everywhere else. Uh, so in our work, the final loss function that we use to train this convolutional neural network is just a weighted summation of these two loss functions. So to summarize this idea, our model is making predictions at a one meter resolution. We're summarizing these predictions up to a 30 meter resolution, the resolution of our uh, low res labels. Uh, and then we're comparing these summarized versions to the ground truth at a 30 meter resolution. And using this, we can train a network with both high and low resolution labels in a unified way. Uh, I'm not going to show re results for this because this is an eight minute talk, um, but we found that this improves the spatial generalization of these networks. So now our networks are making better land cover predictions in areas in which we only have access to the low resolution labels. And you can use this idea in other contexts. For example, if you want to predict land cover from Sentinel-2 imagery, which is a 10 meter spatial resolution, you can form these uh, model with, uh, for example, low resolution land cover labels generated from the MODIS satellites. The MODIS has an annual land cover product at a 500 meter resolution. These are very noisy, uh, but the idea still works. And this actually uh, example is taken from the IEEE's uh, GRSS data fusion competition uh, over the fall. Uh, we won one of the tracks in this competition, not with the super resolution loss idea, um, but with a different idea, but the, the same, same technique still applies. Uh, so combining low resolution labels with uh, limited high resolution labels is what the super resolution idea is all about. Uh, and that's all I have. If you uh, want more information about the work that we're doing on land cover mapping, you can go to this link. Uh, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Kalev. And um, I think, um, do we have a final poll? Or we already ask? This is the final one. Perfect. So while you start answering the question, I will introduce our next and final panelist. So Sarah Prockner from UNEP, WCMC, Global Ocean Observing Systems. And she will um, tell us about the mangrove monitoring in the context of the UN Ocean Decade. Let's wait a few seconds, Sarah, to finish the poll. And I think after uh, this presentation, my colleague Ryan Kastner will start helping us leading the discussion panel. Um, but this has been a very, very interesting, a lot of very interesting presentations. And um, so let's start with you, Sarah. Thank you, Octavio. Thanks for all the really interesting presentations so far on the ins and outs of mangrove monitoring. And now as the final presentation, I just want to set it in the context of international agreements and the UN Ocean Decade. So mangroves really are at the heart of many different international agreements, as you can see here. And this is because they contribute lots to society, but also biodiversity, of course, and our fight against climate change. 
So while all of these agreements incorporate mangroves in some way, um, they are quite different from each other, but there are also synergies across. However, one of the difficulties that currently is faced by policymakers is the lack of agreement within the scientific community and the lack of statistics and simple data to measure progress towards these agreements. Fundamental statistics for use against these need to be agreed, but the data and statistics that feed into the indicators that are used to measure targets that are used to measure progress towards these agreements are often unclear and not harmonized. There are hundreds of long-term programs measuring data out there that could contribute to these, but they're often not globally coordinated and the metadata and raw data may often be hard to find. Data may not be openly accessible for policy and decision makers and programs may collect data in many different ways that are not standardized. Therefore, there's a need for coordination and collaboration to ensure that raw data can be translated to the knowledge and the indicators needed to address those reporting requirements. Collaboration and the Global Mangrove Watch, which we heard a lot about in the earlier presentations, which is a great project and very impressive. And these definitely are opportunities to generate consistent indicators and stats related to mangroves. And generating this core data will help produce indicators for many of these targets. Global Mangrove Watch is actually being proposed as an indicator for the post-2020 strategic agenda on the Convention on Biological Diversity. However, as I said earlier, member states are frustrated with the wide range of data and statistics out there. What they often want is a one-stop shop, so to speak, of data that is reliable and that can bring us a direct avenue from the data to the policy. Therefore, at the most recent United Nations Environment Assembly in 2019, the member states of the UN called for greater cooperation of mapping and evaluating of mangrove ecosystems. This resolution on the sustainable management for global health of mangroves is really leveraged for more studies, more national level approval, and the verification of maps and data sets. By working together, there's an opportunity to present a unified scientific voice regarding mangroves, which is something decision makers are really desperate for. In addition, there's a need to go beyond just the distribution of mangroves and just the extent of it and provide reliable evidence that can be used for indicators relating to the change and the implications for people and biodiversity. So all the presentations we heard about earlier and also the Global Mangrove Watch is a great opportunity to provide these additional data sets and additional information that go beyond the just the extent and really tell us the so what the blue carbon on climate change, the drivers of deforestation, what can we do? But anyway, there is a need for more detailed and localized information about the local context to really make these decisions on the ground and in the area and to see the so what of uh, mangroves for nature and people. Therefore, um, the Global Ocean Observing System has conducted, has looked into in situ programs, since they are important also for validating remotely sensed data sets um, to understand. We looked at those to understand which programs exist and what is needed to integrate the data further. Um, we have been looking to understand the long term mangrove observing that is currently happening in the world. And out of the 346 active long term observing programs found, 15 um, conducted in situ sampling of mangroves. Out of those, all of those use best practices actually, but we do need to work towards basic and, and a complementary set of practices that can be used across local studies so that they can be aggregated globally and also acknowledged globally and used for global agreements and decision-making processes. 70% of those 15 observing programs um, sampled yearly or more frequently, which is great to see the short term and quick changes that we talked about earlier in other presentations. And half of those, but only half of those have openly accessible data. Out of those that do not have openly accessible data, most are working towards it, but often the reason that they could not make it openly accessible is insufficient funding. So what we need is a globally coordinated and sustained measurements to meet the quantitative needs of these various international agreements I was speaking about earlier. But the landscape of biological data globally is still relatively fragmented. 
As such, collaboration requires coordinating frameworks. And on this slide, I'm showing the essential ocean variables and the essential biodiversity variables, which can really act as a framework and as a connecting piece between the biodiversity observations, be that in, through in situ studies, satellite imagery studies, drones, and all of those that are very important, but that need to be kind of brought, be brought together to feed into the indicators so that we can measure um, international reporting and assessments. UVs are therefore best understood as the level of integration between the primary observations and the primary data sets and the indicators of biodiversity change on the other side for any given area. Ideally, these long-term observations that we talked about earlier should be coordinated across regions to understand the larger scale and the national and regional changes in biodiversity over time. We may be able to make mangrove data better findable and interoperable and also accessible for policymakers and for decision makers by ensuring that the mangrove observing communities use best practices that are standardized and data and metadata standards that are of a high quality and also by accessing more open data to facilitate the reporting of international agreements. So here you can see how mangroves are one of the core um, EOVs and they feed into all these other, other habitats that are equally important. And, but those EOVs usually go beyond just the extent and the distribution of mangroves and look more also on species composition, biomass, um, density, and all these other very important variables. And the UN decade of ocean science for sustainable development kind of aims to bring all of this together. The ocean decade can provide an opportunity for scientists, researchers, policymakers, and all other stakeholders to come together and really collaborate in their data management. Sustainable management needs to be underpinned by sustainable science and understanding what is happening, where it is happening, and at which pace is important for ocean management. And just to wrap up a few take home messages. Mangroves are really at the heart of international agreements and they need to be preserved for all the great benefits we gain from them. But there is no one perfect data set that can meet all our needs. Coordination is key to achieve the ambitions of the UN Ocean Decade and is key for policymakers to have easily accessible statistics that they can use for their um, reporting requirements. So everyone has a role to play, whether it's in situ, aerial, satellite imagery, all these different ways of gaining mangrove data are important to be aggregated together and um, give us a more fuller picture of reality. So open data, best practices and metadata standards, such as those from the, from the EOVs can really support robust indicators. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. So, um, well, we can start the discussion. Um, Ryan, do you want to begin? <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. Um, so there's a, a number of uh, great uh, comments in there. Um, I think one of the one of the big ones um, that I would I would like to discuss is. Um, uh, Basically, how do um, how do we get everybody that's here? How do we get these uh, whatever 150 people that have attended, 250 people that attended today to get involved with these efforts? Um, so a lot of people were saying, "I have this data. Um, you know, how can I use these technologies? Um, things like that." So um, I think that's a, a big outcome of today. Should be uh, how do we how do we get everybody involved and how do we get everybody moving forward in, in the same uh, kind of on the same ship to save everything? So. Uh, uh, if anybody has any thoughts, I think that's a big question, but I think that's uh, an important one um, that uh, maybe you could, everybody can address. I think uh, initially, uh, those with field data, as I was mentioned in this morning session, um, to reach out to people like the Globe Mangrove Watch, um, I know that they're very keen to um, assimilate as much data as possible into their own verification methods. Um, and I know that they um, will gladly take any um, local scale uh, field data or maps that anyone has to, to help um, improve the, the kind of global scale products. 
And maybe also on, on the point more of how do we um, get local people to uh, gather good data and collect good data um, and maybe validate data for us? Yeah, that's a potentially more challenging um, um, question, but I think there are some uh, great initiatives out there, some great resources for um, doing uh, some really uh, great local field campaigns. Um, I know that um, there are certain organizations like Sevilla who do uh, outreach and learning um, sessions for, uh, for for different um, like local scale projects. So help people to use remote sensing data themselves. Um, and then I'm sure there are similar um, initiatives that help people get into the field and. Um, really kind of get that science quality data that, that we need. Astrid, I know you have a lot of experience with this. Um, do you have any, any Yeah, comment? building on this, um, I think kind of like how uh, Nathan mentioned how we have Global Mangrove Watch, um, excuse me, Global Mangrove Alliance. Um, a lot of the projects that we have there, um, we're working on uh, creating almost like a clearinghouse of methodologies as well. And so, let's say at least on a small, very local scale, right? Um, it's really important to be able to kind of connect with the people who are actually on the ground and who are doing this work. Um, and that can take a lot of different shapes and a lot of different forms. Um, but if anything, that's something that we've learned out in Mexico is to really work closely with the government um, and the folks there who are you know, who need this data and are handling this data to make management decisions and to establish channels where we can build capacity, where we can ask what their needs are and be able to address them. And I think Lola, do you want to contribute something? Sure, I, I just wanted to follow on on what both Nathan and Astrid have said is because, um, you know, we have some people who are more on the side where they're really interacting with um, people on the ground and then some of us are really more focused on you know developing these products and so i think one thing that um in some ways the global mangrove alliances has allowed is that it's bringing us together which is really great and it's helping us uh, those of us who are primarily on the product development side kind of know okay what is it what is it that you actually need on the ground and so that's actually in some ways how the global loss drivers map came up came about is because we were talking to people and they said, well, we really need to know why mangroves are being lost. And we said, okay, well, maybe we'll try to see if we can start working, prioritize our next project on that. Um, so, you know, I think also having this interaction is really important, having people, you know, kind of tell us what it is that they're, that they really need. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always a proponent of open science. I think it's really important, which is why I tried to show some of the apps that we did and some of the, um, try to share links is that um, it's really important to share your data sets when they're, when they're produced, when they're published, you know, they get lost in a, maybe a scientific publication. For us, it's, it's great, it's interesting, but when you're on the ground, you're not reading those publications. You really want to know where to get the data. So I think making those linkages people continuing to remind us, you know, this is what we need and where can we get what you've already done. Um, those are really things that are very important. And, and you know, I think that that's one of the, the strengths that having this alliance is, is doing is that it's combining the scientific side and then the people who are on the ground together. And Caleb, do you have any thoughts on, uh, you know, how large companies like Microsoft and Google's and uh, Facebook's and things like that can, can help out in this, these efforts? Yeah, good question. Uh, this is kind of my fifth my fifth week here, uh, but again, sharing uh, sharing data I think is a very very important component, um, and also compute uh, compute is something that is necessary when working with these huge global scale uh, data sets. Um, so uh, I'm a massive fan of tools like Google Earth Engine. Uh, and interactive web applications that can get the both data and compute into the hands of local stakeholders uh, and experts in the same sort of platform. So I think that's a very cool direction that we can move forward with. Yeah, the, the visualization aspect, I think of all of this is just really, really stunning. And um, all of that is becoming uh, a lot easier these days. And I think that actually helps a lot in terms of uh, 
you know, making action into policy, right? So getting all of this to actually convince some people that this is a, a problem, right? So we see what Lolo was showing today on erosion, right? And that's a really compelling thing that I think most people can can understand. Um, so I think those sort of technologies that, um, you know, not only allow us to look at the data, but actually visualize it and visualize it in a way that um, um, a layperson can understand is, 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 is really important going forward. And some of the other questions um, that we had, I think, um, kind of revolve around um, just the technologies themselves. So a lot of these technologies, um, you know, if you, if you haven't, if you're not familiar with them, they may seem like almost like science fiction, right? So um, NASA shooting lasers from space, perhaps we shouldn't be surprised by that, but, uh, you know, that's, that's pretty crazy, right? It's uh, pretty insane what we can do. Um, so what can we do with these technologies? Um, what's easy? Um, what do you think is on the cusp? You know, what is, what is coming within the next year or two? And then what, what do you think would, you know, maybe in 10 years time, what do you think we could potentially do with some of these, these technologies? I'm assuming this is a question for me. Uh, for you, I think for everybody, to be honest, because oh, I think all yeah. technologies are really cool, right? right. Uh, and, you know, honestly, if I if I wasn't a computer science professor, I, I wouldn't uh, believe a lot of these things were could, could be possible. But yeah, sure, I think your lasers from space is is, is certainly probably one of the, the craziest ones, right? So uh, okay. perhaps can you tell really? us a little bit more about what, what you can do there? What, with that, what can we do with uh, the satellite LIDAR or, or some other things that NASA is cooking up? Sure. I mean, I, I always enjoy seeing the drone imagery because it's so clear, you know, it's like, you know what you're seeing. I, I really, I really love looking at those data sets, but, um, and, and please everyone else also step in when I'm talking, but it's, it seems like when, I, when I'm looking also at the, the questions that we're getting that um, one of the, the next steps that people are very much interested in is getting species, mangrove species, um, better species differentiation or information. Um, on the NASA perspective, I know that there are a few um, upcoming missions that are uh, planned that will help us better understand what species composition is um, in, all, in all vegetations, but also in mangroves. And, and in many ways, I think mangroves are, are a great, um, not just an example where we can apply these, um, these um, technologies, but it's just been shown that, you know, because they are relatively simple organisms in terms of species composition and their location is always in a coastal area. This has allowed us to really advance mangrove remote sensing science, I think in some ways more than many other types of um, uh, terrestrial or aquatic remote sensing science. So to me, I think uh, being able to better differentiate between species composition is one of the, the next steps on the, on, the, um, on the mangrove mapping side. Um, just a follow up with Lola on the, uh, in the next few years, um, well, actually, currently with um, this now two uh, space borne laser instruments, um, in a couple of years, we're going to have a brand new NASA uh, radar instrument. Um, and I know the Europeans are following up um, with their own um, radar instruments, and also uh, Japanese space agency have their own LIDAR instrument. So, in the next sort of decade, we're going to have a, a massive increase in the amount of volume of data that we're going to get from space. Um, the radar data that we are, uh, the satellite that's being launched in a couple of years, NISA or NISA, um, that mission alone is going to collect more data of Earth than NASA has ever collected for the whole solar system combined. Um, so it's just a, an enormous volume of data. So looking really ahead, um, I think uh, just the different modes and the different, and the sheer amount of data we're going to get is going to really help us unlock some of these um, kind of next questions about what to has. Um, and how to answer those questions. And just for scale, uh, what, how, how much data are we talking about here? How... Oh, so I think um, raw data, it's a couple of terabytes a day, and that scales up into dry products into hundreds of terabytes a day. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think maybe that's then sort of a lead into something that Caleb can answer is, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we deal with all of this, right? And uh, maybe what is behind all of these algorithms you talked about compute and the need for that. Um, so what is the, what is happening there and what is the kind of, what can we see as the future of, of the analysis of this data? Uh, is that for me or? Yeah, for you, Caleb, yes. Uh -huh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so uh, I know uh, one thing that the AI for Earth team here at Microsoft is doing is trying to uh, 
developed this idea of a planetary computer where you can run um, kind of algorithms that you might run now in locally in a Jupyter notebook on small amounts of data uh, at scale across entire data sets. Um, so there's a lot of engineering and infrastructure work that has to go into that uh, that utilizes uh, kind of Azure on the back end. Um, I know with Google Earth Engine, obviously you can run uh, these giant computations, uh, but having it in JavaScript or Python form uh, is, very, is very useful as well. Uh, so to kind of summarize, developing algorithms with this scale in mind is necessary and having the platforms from these large companies to run it over uh, many, many terabytes without having to you know, develop the knowledge of the parallel programming that you would need to do this by yourself is very important. And also from NASA side too, it would be great. Yeah, and also from the ecological side of the of the problem, I don't know if Steve is still with us here, but uh, it's very important to what what do you think about the opportunities that technologies like drone is is giving us to understand better the ecology of a lot of biodiversity that uh, use these ecosystems and until now satellites is, are still far from from that i i you mentioned that the small patches are not part of these um um databases uh but they are very very important for the connectivity of many species yeah so i i think it's a matter of coordinating at the local scale because drones you know have have their niche uh, we need to be monitoring ma uh, mangroves at multiple scales and uh, drones provide you know uh, detailed analysis of a small area and it's a simple approach where you can train you know th this can be crowdsourced and and uh, it, it's a fairly easy approach to collect a lot of detailed data and you're able to get the the data that you need it's personal remote sensing where where you can do it on a regular interval and you can detect changes and that's really what these smaller islands need uh, to be able to check on a you know a regular basis and and you can get the biophysical information uh, combining the the point clouds that you can generate with uh, with the field data just a real powerful tool uh, at that scale and 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 I think it's important that we that we develop a hierarchy of of information flow. So we have regional coordinators that can communicate with national coordinators. And I know we talked about this with the Global Mangrove Alliance to be able to allow this this data to flow up and down, um, collected at these different scales. I think that's an, an important part uh, uh, going to, into the future. Yeah, and building on Steve, I think not only in terms of the data availability availability to flow between all these different levels, but also that they're um, complementing each other in a very uh, sustainable way, in a very logical way as well, especially as you know, Caleb presented the promise of having multi-resolution imagery and algorithms um, demonstrates that we can all work together among all these different, you know, niche spots to kind of push the remote sensing envelope, <laughs> so to speak, um, both in terms of, you know, the techniques and the tools that we have, as well as the resulting labels um, and the imagery itself. How do you ambition, for all of you, how do you ambition the the monitoring programs, mangrove monitoring programs in the future? How do you think uh, um, we can establish better collaboration and coordination between all of these groups and the data transparency, data sharing uh, with all this information? Well, I, I, just to comment on that, I think we need not only the hierarchy working at multiple scales, but also uh, working groups where we have specific research questions that that uh, 
that we're working on. So we, we identify those, those research interests and, and then we work collaboratively based on our, our interests. Um, I think that would be a great, great idea that the uh, Mangrove Alliance um, could continue to work towards. Any other one? <laughs> Lola. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I, I agree with what Steve was saying, you know, continuing to work together. Um, and um, as I mentioned before, also is to, you know, try to, to have that, that, that interaction or that discussion between the, you know, the, the remote sensing science group or, and the applications users. I think it's, it'll just be a, it's, it's a continued effort and a continuous effort and a continuous interaction and conversations that need to happen on those sides. Uh, if I can jump in, uh, one thing that I would love to see would be a kind of place where uh, ground truth validation points for all kinds of different remote sensing projects uh, could be collected and organized together. So if you do have an algorithm that combines kind of data from multiple resolutions or a new idea, you can test it quickly against uh, sort of a large number of known ground truth points uh, instead of having interpreted imagery as a validation step. I think that would really, really help everyone speed up. Well, we are reaching the time. Uh, I think uh, some people were asking if the results of the polls uh, can be shared. Is, do we, do we present the results or? Um, I do believe we presented them, but I can here for the last one, I can reshare them. Okay, so, and this is one of the, the most important things. Yes, the accessing high resolution imagery is one of the, the uh, limitations. Um, well, I just have one last question and I don't know, Ryan, if you have more questions, but uh, especially for Sarah, uh, how this, uh, information, all this technical information that is generated by um, all these fantastic groups doing a great research can really incorporate it to decision making, especially or in particular, for example, the uh, right now the NDCs for countries, the non determinant contribution of each country, they are very vague and many countries uh, or the governments of many countries justify this uh, emptiness in these kind of documents because in theory there is no information but as we are seeing there are there is a lot of information and actually it's, it's uh, available for for many of these uh, governments so how we can really um, connect all this information with um public policy instruments like the NDCs? So I guess there's a distinction between whether that's on the global level, whether that's, or what's, whether it's the nationally determined contributions to NDCs. And for the national um, level, there should be also collaboration, of course, within the country of these in situ monitoring programs, whether they communicate within just that country or of course, global data sets can be used. Like the Global Mangrove Watch is a great opportunity now. It might not be 100% accurate for a very local level, for very local decision-making, but on a national level, that would be a great opportunity. And if biomass is going to be incorporated there, that is definitely a good um, information source for governments. And to link that up is of course quite a task, but there are ways such as the UN Biodiversity Lab that's um, was helping countries in their efforts of the six national reports for the Convention on Biological Diversity. And there are other efforts to always connect decision makers with the data and the science. But as I said earlier, it's a challenge and a lot needs to happen for people to link up and for people to communicate and talk to each other really. Well, if um, there are no more questions, I hope that we can continue uh, collaborating and, and increasing all this information. 
I think Astrid, are we gonna send um, an, an email with the results of uh, all these two webinars? And um, uh, I, I think also these videos will be available for uh, after this presentation. Could, could you tell us something about this? Yes, absolutely. So both session one and session two are recorded. Um, they'll be available online shortly. Um, and you'll get an email actually with those links for those as well. And a couple of key statistics uh, results from this webinar will also be shared. So I'll keep an eye out for that. And thank you so much for tuning in. Well, uh, Ryan, if you have something else, if not. Uh, no, I think um, it's just, it was really great to see uh, people from all over the world, um, you know, interested in these amazing ecosystems. Um, I think we're, we're at a point where we have a kind of an unprecedented opportunity to monitor and understand, rehabilitate these, these mangroves um, at, the, at a worldwide scale. And so these technologies, you know, they, I said earlier, they kind of seem like science fiction, but they're real, right? The presenters have shown that they're real. Um, but I think we need to kind of use this as a start, just a starting point. Um, we need to develop more of these science fiction technologies. And we need to get these technologies into the hands of the peoples that can use them. Um, we need scientists working hand in hand with technologists. Um, we need people with boots on the ground to gather data for us and validate the data. We need these huge computing platforms to um, ingest this data and analyze it, and then ultimately just make this uh, data uh, compelling, uh, present it in a compelling way to policymakers so that we can truly bring about change. Um, so I think you know there's a huge challenge here. We, we've laid that out in those two sessions, um, but there's there's a lot of efforts and. Um, my, my, my challenge, I think, to everybody is um, to, to go forward and think about ways that we can join these efforts um, and make a much bigger impact. And it'd be really cool if like in 10 years time, we look back at this, this uh, session today and said, you know, this was really the, the springboard um, for an important moment in, uh, in global mangrove rehabilitation. Um, so I think uh, with that, we can say goodbye. Uh, we're a little bit over our time. Uh, thanks everybody for attending and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. And thank you, Astrid, Lola, Nathan, Saram, um, Steve, and Caleb for all these presentations and all the, the team. Um, uh, thank you very much and bye bye for the next time. <laughs> thank you. Bye bye. Bye, everyone.